Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Harry Sherrard, and on behalf of the talks team, very uh, warm welcome to our latest uh, presentation. A uh, couple of quick things. We have our membership people down at the back with a lovely selection of books that they tell me they will sell to the, the best offer. So uh, anybody who would like to add to your motorsport library uh, this evening is the, the time to do it. Um, uh, also, you can obviously join. If you're not a Brooklyn's member, we uh, would obviously love you to, uh, to join up. And you've seen we've got a great talks program coming up for the rest of the year and uh, lots of other things going on. So a little taster there of uh, the story of the Benetton and the various films that we uh, put together for you. But um, tonight is all about uh, Damien Smith and Pat Simmons. Please welcome to the stage. Well, good evening. Uh, lovely to see so many of you here today. And uh, at Brooklyn's, it's always special special place to come, particularly uh, tonight, because if we were coming tomorrow night, obviously the M25 would be shut and we'd all be camping for the weekend. So, um, uh, so thank you to Harry and for his, his team for organising uh, what I hope will be a really special evening here at Brooklands. Um, and it should also be mentioned that Harry and his team, that the team are, are all volunteers. So um, I think uh, I'm really grateful to their, to their work in putting this evening together. Um, so yes, we're here to talk about Benetton and we have the ideal person to do so. Um, Pat Simmons was uh, the chief engineer at Benetton and Tolman before that for many years and then later in the, uh, the later 90s he became technical director of the team. Uh, and these days of course um, he's chief technical officer for Formula One in general. So the ultimate po poacher turned gamekeeper I think it's fair to say. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted uh, that Pat could join us tonight. It's really special. He was a huge help uh, with this book. This book actually wouldn't have happened without Pat. I needed to get his blessing before I, I even attempted to try and write it and uh, he very kindly um, gave me his blessing, wrote the foreword and uh, gave me a lot of his time, sat over cups of tea in his kitchen talking about the 80s and 90s and some, some great old stories uh, and it's all in the, all in the book uh, which is on sale at the back of the room if you haven't got a copy. Um, so what I've done is I've got a, a selection of pictures that we've taken from the book and we're just basically going to talk through um, uh, the, the pictures and the themes, the major themes of the team. Um, it's not the whole 20-year history of Benetton because it's, uh, it's all in the book. You can read about it. It's, it's, uh, uh, we've only got one evening. I don't want to keep you here all, all weekend. But we're going to start by just, just, just flicking through. And uh, the first picture here we got is um, Michael Schumacher with Luciano Benetton. And one of the key things about this book that I was intrigued by is why a, a so-called woolly jumper company would buy a Formula 1 team. And Luciano wasn't a particularly... Um, public face uh, in this team, was he, Pat? But you, you told me, um, in a way, Benetton were ideal owners for a Formula One team. Why was that? Yeah, I think they were. Um, I mean, Luciano was a really remarkable character. He was so forward-thinking. Uh, he, he was so sort of international. Uh, and there were so many things about the way they ran the business, the woolly jumper business, as he described it. And... Um, you know, his sort of forward thinking, his sort of worldwide marketing. I mean, just as, as an example, one thing that really impressed me when we first went over to Treviso, where they were based, was that, and you've got to remember, this is the days before the internet and, and easy communication and everything, but they did actually have a system where all the stores worldwide would send in their daily sales every evening, so it's on a daily basis, uh, which basically said what colours of pullovers they were selling. And all the Benetton pullovers were white, and then they would dye them depending on the way the sales were going. And it was that sort of forward thinking, I think, that just fitted in so nicely with, with having what was rapidly becoming a global sport um, to, to publicise what they were doing. And, and they brought such a freshness into it. Uh, and Luciano, was, uh, he was so supportive of everything we did. He, yeah. he, he really was a remarkable character. Mm. The team, um, the, the, the book I called Rebels of Formula One for a reason. The, the, the team was kind of a, uh, a bit of an outsider team from the beginning, and you, you kind of kept that spirit all the way through. And actually, Benetton, um, the more I looked into the, the clothing company, I don't know much about fashion, as you can tell, um, <laughs> but they... Um, uh, they had that sort of rebellious kind of nature as a company themselves, didn't they? It was a perfect kind of marriage in a way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, their, their advertising at the time was, was world famous. Mm. They, they, they probably got more publicity from 
making the adverts and actually displaying the adverts because they were so controversial. And they allowed us to go, not allowed us, they encouraged us to go racing in this sort of um, non-conventional manner. And, and, you know, Formula One was very, very conventional in those days. Yeah. Uh, the, the sort of grandee teams, the constructors, they, they, they've been doing things in a certain way for a long while. Um, and they were automotive based. And along came this, this woolly jumper manufacturer. I, I like that expression. <laughs> uh, and, you know, decided that they could get in, not only get into Formula One, but start to dominate it. And um, I think they approached the way they were doing it in very much the way they approached all of their businesses. And, and actually, something that's a model these days still, I think, where you find the right people to do things, you give them the freedom to do it, you trust in them, and mm. you let them get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next picture. Now, we, I've picked something from the Tolman years here. Now, obviously, Tolman, this was 1984, famous picture of Ayrton Senna at uh, Monaco. I'll talk to Pat about that in a second because it's uh, one, of, one of the key, key keystone moments um, for this, this racing team was that day in the wet at Monaco. Um, Tolman obviously started much earlier than 84, and you joined in the uh, beginning of 81, didn't you? Just right. as the Formula 1 adventure was beginning, and they'd yes. just come off the back of great Formula 2 success uh, in, in 1980. Uh, Tolman, now just, just tell me a little bit about Tolman, what it was like turning up at Whitney with this sort of band of, again, rebellious kind of characters. Um, John, he's calling you a rebellious character. <laughs> <laughs> I'm we sure have you weren't. <laughs> John Gentry in the audience tonight. He was um, one of the uh, work, work with Rory Byrne on the, the design of the car. Um, so yeah, tell, tell us a little bit. About so uh, yeah, I came along beginning of '81. Um, I was employee number 20 uh, because the team that you know, with John and, and uh, Rory that had been running and dominating Formula Two really was a, a very very small team. And I think from memory, by the time we went racing, which was uh, Imola, I believe, that, that year. We were still only around 60 people. And this was, you know, designing, manufacturing, racing, the, the, the whole lot. Uh, we were an incredibly ambitious group. Um, I think ambitious is a nice word. Hmm. Stupid is probably also <laughs> apt. But, but we, we really just went into it in a totally unconventional way. Um, John and Rory have been incredibly successful with Pirelli in Formula 2, so, yeah, why not bring Pirelli into, into Formula 1? Everyone else was running good years. Well, we can do better than that. Um, they've been very successful with the heart engine. Uh, we shouldn't go with the DFV. We should, we should have a turbo. Brian will make us one, so we, we went in that direction. Uh, I mean, even down to, you know, the size of the wheels. We went for, for these very large diameter wheels um, to get bigger brakes in. And, and really, everything was, was very, very unconventional. Um, but I think it just showed our ambition. And, you know, our, our sort of management meetings used to be in the pubs just before closing time. And we used to sort of sit there and say, well, how many points are we going to score this year? And, you know, they... The, uh, I, I think if you took an average, it was a, <laughs> well, it was an infinite number more than we scored because we never scored any point. In fact, we struggled to, to qualify that year. Um, but it, it was such a fun place to, to, to work. I, I was early in my career. I was learning so much from people like John and, and Rory. Um, I was probably, you know, the slightly more sort of academic engineer and, and, you know, it was nice to be able to start to, to put a little bit of that into, into what we were doing. Mm. Uh, it, it really was, it was fun times, but it, it was pretty hard work as well. Yeah, and I, I managed to speak to Rory for the book, um, and it was actually during COVID, and he was in, he was in a, a Bangkok hotel room, and he was having to isolate for 10 days, um, and he, he literally just had room uh, service left outside his door. He hadn't seen anyone. Uh, and I got him on the phone. I think the only reason he took my call was because he's bored, basically. But he did take my call. It was great to speak to him. He's a lovely man. Uh, and obviously, one of the most influential racing car designers, full stop. Um, but he told me how he was learning on the job, really, um, in those early years. You all were, in terms of Formula 1. You're all fairly, fairly much new to Formula 1, really. Uh, going your own way, making your own mistakes. But by the time this photo was taken in 84, you were a good team. And this was a good car. And you had, obviously... 
an extremely good driver who was new to Formula One himself. Yeah, all of the above, I think. Um, you know, the, the 81 car, the, the, the car that got christened, or well, variously the, the General Belgrano or the, the mm. Flying Pig, uh, and it was both. Um, yeah, it, it, it was definitely a car where our, our ambition exceeded our ability. Mm. Um, I think John was the only one who actually really had any, uh, John and probably our chief mechanic at the time, uh, Sal, were the only people who had any Formula One experience. Uh, and the rest of us, no, nothing like that. So, you know, it was very much a, a learning car. But then uh, we produced the, uh, the car that went on to, to become the, the 83 car, because the 82 car, the, the 81 car ran through 82 as well. And you know, that was the third carbon monocoque that existed. That I think only McLaren and Lotus had made a carbon monocoque before us. And even with the, the previous car, John had designed it in such a way that it was effectively made in the same way that you'd make a, a carbon composite car. In other words, uh, separate skins and honeycomb, etc., cetera, um, all cured in an autoclave. Uh, and the difference being, you know, it was aluminium skins rather than, than carbon skins. So it, it was really quite advanced in, in many ways. But really, the, the breakthrough came here in, in 84 and it, it was a, quite a troubled thing in, in some ways because the 84 car was very good but the big thing about it was the switch to Michelin tyres and uh, you know that also helped us a, a lot. Um, Brian Hart was working with, with Zytec or the company that later became Zytec and started to get an electronic control onto the, the turbo engine which made it a lot more drivable. Uh, in fact, I think Monaco was the first time it ran, and it was on, on Ayrton's car. Um, so, you know, all, all these sort of things combined to actually give us something quite good. But the interesting thing was that although we'd gone to the Michelin tyres, which really were much better, and, you know, we'd done a fair bit of testing prior to the, this car being introduced. Uh, it was introduced to Dijon early in the year. Um, we'd managed to get the contract with Michelin, but McLaren, or Ron Dennis, ha had insisted that if Michelin were to give the tyres to, to us at Tolman, they were not to be the latest spec. They always had to be the spec sort of a year behind or whatever. And of course, in Monaco, we were on wets, and there wasn't a different spec of wets. So it was a, one of the, the few times in the year, I think Estrell at the end of the year was the only other time, when we were on the same spec tyres as all the other Michelin runners. And yeah, it was a hell of a race. And uh, I think, you know, at the end of it, we had such mixed feelings. Yeah. I didn't know whether to be elated that we'd finish second, you know, after years of not qualifying and scrabbling around for, for points. And remember, you only got points up to sixth place in, in those days. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the elation of, of being up there on the podium and the immense disappointment of not winning. Mm. And it, it's funny because for a few hours, I think the elation won. And for the next however many years that is, 40 <laughs> years, it's, it's the disappointment yeah. has definitely uh, risen to the top. Yeah. Of course, one of the special things that you've got is you worked with Senna at the start of his career. And then um, later you worked with Schumacher, the two great drivers of those, of those two decades. Um, could you tell us a little bit about Ayrton, what he was like to work with, and the intensity of him and what he was like? Yeah, he, he was an interesting character. You know, he, he wasn't the sort of guy, unlike Michael, you know, the sort of, Michael was the sort of guy who he just immediately you, you became friendly with. Ethan was such a serious guy, so, so intense. But it was pretty obvious straight away that he, he was something special. Mm. Now, I think, as I say in the book, that, that doesn't denigrate any of the previous drivers. You know, Derek, even Brian Henton, Teo, they, they'd all been good drivers, but Ayrton was a little bit different. And you've got to remember in these days, you know, we didn't have all the data acquisition that we, we have these days. We didn't, uh, we weren't able to just see exactly what the car was doing. I mean, we relied on the driver for pretty well everything. We relied on him 
you know, even to get the gear ratios right, we needed to know what the, the revs were at the end of the straight. The only way we knew was for the driver to tell us. Had we got the, the cooling right, the blanking on the radiators and things, well, the driver had to tell us what the oil temperature was and the water temperature. So it's a very, very different world. Um, but Ayrton just, he just got into it and, and in such a way that you, you just, I, I think, I think what's remarkable was that after a couple of races, you, you totally forgot he was a newcomer. Mm. You know, he, he was like he'd been there forever and he, he knew everything that was going on. And he had this remarkable feel for, for both the engine and the chassis. Um, yeah, it, it, we were all growing up together, I would say. You know, yeah. Certainly me, I, you know, I was a very young and experienced engineer. Uh, working with a driver who, yeah, he had a lot of capability, but again, he was still... Yeah. young and learning yeah but um yeah he slotted into formula one like he'd been there all his life mm. now we could do a whole evening on tolman mm. um there's one for you harry actually we could do, a, do another one on, on just just on the tolman team because there's so much to talk about but i'm going to move things on to a year later so this is monaco in 85 and uh, this is still a tolman um but as you can see it's got all those little um little flags on it and the United Colours of Benetton sticker. And the other key thing I just want to point out is those tyres, uh, the Prelli tyres. Now, that was key for this car, wasn't it? Because um, for a long time, this car wasn't going to race. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and you know, all these years later, that's still one of my favourite cars. It, it was such a good car. It was the easiest car to set up I've, I've ever known. It had, you know, such an enormous sweet spot. And by this time, you know, we'd, we'd got the wind tunnel running and we were really starting to understand a lot more about what was going on. So it was, a, it was a lovely car. It didn't score any points. I think it didn't even finish a race, did it? Nearly finished no, it was, in record. Yeah, it was classified, but it didn't actually complete the full distance. Uh, it ran out of fuel, which yeah. we, we, we knew it would. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it, it couldn't hold enough fuel to do a, a Grand Prix, which in the other... <laughs> It's a bit of a problem. Yeah. No, it wasn't for the other 15 events <laughs> because it had no hope of getting to that <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, um, yeah. The other but, key yeah, thing... It was, it, as you say, the, the, the big thing here, of course, was that we started the year not going racing. Yeah. And, and I'd, I've got a, a photo at home, and I'm sure Greg's probably got the same photo, of the three uh, 185s at Donington. Not in these colours. They're in the sort of red, white, and blue of the, the, the Tolman colours at that time. And our drivers were John Watson and Stefan Johansson. We had the three cars there on even tyres up at Donington for a mm. bit of a shakedown. And that was the last that was sort of seen of them until we, we got racing later in the year when Pirelli eventually agreed to give us some tyres. It took ages to find a photo in the blue and white, red, red white and blue colours. Um, and Chris Whitty, who was going to join us tonight, isn't, isn't here, but he managed to find me a picture of Stefan Johansson uh, driving at, um, at Silverstone. And I, in the book, I, I talked to John Watson, who was slated to drive the car, and he loved the car. He said it was a great car, uh, the brief experience he had with it. And he really wanted to work with Rory as well, and he said how great that was. Uh, very sort of fleeting, um, uh, skimming the, the, the surface of, of Tolman, and it, it, didn't, it didn't work out for John. But the other key thing about this car and this year is, so we all call this a Tolman, but you and your colleagues in Whitney consider this the first Benetton, don't you, really? Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, Benetton had effectively, we were in the, the process of taking over the, the team uh, during this, this season. And uh, I think we still entered under Tolman, but we were owned by, yeah. by Benetton. So let's move on to this car, which is a really famous car, the 86 B186 Benetton, the first official Benetton in terms of name and with that great colour scheme with the, uh, the splashes uh, over the back. And this is Gerhard Berger. Again, at Monaco, just Monaco because it's a great place to take pictures of racing cars and you can get a great view of the, uh, of the paintwork on the back. Um, and um, the one thing I wanted to ask you about was Gerhard, actually, because you worked with Gerhard twice. You worked with him at this stage, the early stages of his Formula 1 career, and then towards the end. Um, I'm always quite fascinated by the early Gerhard. Um, tell us what, what he was like in 86 when you worked with him. Uh, well, firstly, he's a hell of a character, and he, he still is. I, I saw him last week, actually, and he, he just doesn't seem to change. Um, 
In fact, actually, in, in Bahrain, I nearly had a heart attack because I saw Gerhard and Jean Lacey at the same time. <laughs> and it was like, oh, no. It's <laughs> flashbacks. This can't be happening. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, this, this really was a remarkable car. And, and Gerhard, um, yeah, he, he went for it with this car because, you know, this was a brutal car. Uh, it wasn't... It wasn't as good as the, the 185 in terms of setup and everything, partly because, you know, now it had some power. And I think in that video they, they said sort of 1340 uh, horsepower. Uh, and and that, that was our initial target. Now, there was no dyno around at that time that could measure that. So what we had to do was we had to, to measure the power at a given boost, turn the boost up and get a curve yeah. and then we could extrapolate that up to what we thought the maximum was. And, and that's a megawatt, you know, that's, that's something. And our, our further ambition was to try and get 1,500 horsepower out of it, which would have been one horsepower per cc. But we never actually quite, quite got to that. Mm. But to answer your question, I mean, Gerhard, um, he, was, he, he was really quite a mixture. He, he, he's quite an intense character in the car, but he was a lot of fun out of the car. And uh, again, early in his career, you know, he had a very long career. But um, yeah, he, he was really good in this car under all circumstances. Now, the other driver in, in this year was Teo. And Teo was a very underrated driver, I thought. But Teo was really at his best in a very fast circuit and providing there was no other cars around. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, okay, so yeah, that's probably not the best way to go racing, is it? But um, if you take somewhere like Austria uh, with this car, uh, in qualifying, Gerhard went out, he set a, a, a lap time that was good for pole, uh, quite a long way ahead of everyone else. Teo was half a lap behind him and beat it. So we had, we had a 1-2 on the grid in Austria with this car. But uh, the minute it got into the race... Uh, and incidentally, neither car finished. But the minute he got into the race, Teo just went backwards because now, you know, he had, yeah. he had to fight in, in the pack. And that was a real shame. But, but Gerhard, he could make use of this car. You know, a place like Monaco, this car was brutal. Yeah. And later in the year, one of the things I loved about this, this car, when we got to Monza in September... Um, for the non-technical, you know, the, the turbo cars run a wastegate, and the wastegate opens to control the boost pressure. And by the time we got to Monza, we didn't have a wastegate on the car. We just had, you know, we saved the weight of just not having it on there. So the amount of boost that it could produce was just a function of how good that turbo was, how, what the tip clearances were like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, Gerhard got pole at Monza again, I think. And we had about five and a half bar boost on that, and that's where we, we extrapolated to our 1340 horsepower. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he could tame it. And the thing about Teo, um, he took three pole positions in his F1 career. He took two in 86 and an 85 Nürburgring. Never led a lap of a Grand Prix, which just <laughs> says it all about Teo. Something would always go wrong for him. Just, just one, of those, one of those drivers who... Well, he, just going back to the 85 pole at, at, at Nürburgring that, that, was, that was quite the, an amusing sort of incident because remember in those days we used to have two qualifying sessions and your, your fastest time from either session determined the grid so on Friday Teo had been fastest and on Saturday it rained and uh, in the rain uh, he had quite a heavy shunt actually on the, on the pit straight just got on the power a bit early and it turned it into the, into the pit wall. No hands devices in those days. So his helmet hit the steering wheel and he was concussed. And he got out of the car and went back to the, the motor home. And because we, we used to joke so much amongst us, uh, you know, which was typical of the team. And Teo, was, he was really acting odd. And I was sort of thinking, you know, really, you know, is he, what's the matter with him? Uh, and I said, you do remember you're on pole, don't you? And he said, yeah, sure, you know, tell, tell me another one. And he, he had actually, uh, he did have a concussion, but of course in those days, yeah. 
just carried on, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Slight lack of health and safety compared to today. Um, we'll just touch quickly on um, the first win in 86 uh, at Mexico. So this was a, a tyre-related win, uh, really, rather than a performance-related one. But I also wanted to just point out this chap here... Um, is a, is a key figure in the Benetton story, but it's kind of a little bit forgotten. Um, David Paolini, who was Benetton's right-hand man, and basically he was the marketing guy at Benetton, and he was the guy who kind of um, suggested that they get involved in Formula 1 in the first place in the, um, uh, in the early 80s. So he was quite a key figure. Um, but what's your memories of this, of this win? Was it, it must have been a big moment for you all to actually get a, get a victory. Well, this tyre-related win... Mm, I, thought it was, I thought it was a talent-related win. I've got, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yes, I forgot it's a talent-related <laughs> But you're quite right. Um, yeah, this was Mexico, and uh, the car was good there because altitude and, of course, you know, the, the turbo engines were, were better than the, the DFPs there. So we were starting, you know, from a good point. But um, it was the first year in Mexico. People didn't know the track. We were running quite a hard Pirelli tyre. And the Goodyear runners were on a much softer tyre, which um, literally just fell apart. Uh, and so we, we dominated by, by not stopping. Um, memories of it? Uh, I think one of the, the big memories was Luciano was there, actually, at that, that race. Mm. Uh, and when we, run it, when we won it, uh, he said, well, we're going to play the British national anthem because it's a British team. And, and that was something that meant an awful lot to... Uh, to everyone who worked there, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a big thing for him to say as well. Oh, yeah, huge, wow. huge. Yeah. OK, well, we're only about halfway through, and we're only at 1986, so we better, we better crack on. Um, I've picked this picture for a reason. Uh, Thierry Bootson blowing up in a big, big fashion at Silverstone. Reliability in the 80s. Um, you, you went on from... You never had the same engine year on year. It was always a different engine. You went from the BMW to the Ford Turbo and then to the um, no, normally aspirated uh, Ford Power. Um, and what, what were your memories of this this time? Because the Benetton were always a team at this era who were knocking on the door. You were nearly there, um, but it, you always just fell short. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's a, a fair comment. Um, and, you know, people often underestimate the value of continuity in a team. It's so important. You, know, you see what Max is doing now, um, and it's largely because you know, he's been with the team for a while. They know exactly what he needs in a car. They set the car up for him. We had the same with Lewis at Mercedes. We had the same with um, Fernando at Renault. And what we didn't have at this time was any continuity. You know, we were changing engines all the time. Um, we, we had the contract... With Ford, we had the, the GB engine, the little V6 turbo, which was a lovely engine, absolutely wonderful engine. And it had a huge potential. Um, the trouble was that it had been developed on mobile fuel. And we had a contract with BP. And um, Sorry, it's the other way around. It had been developed on BP. We had a contract with mobile. And... Cosworth had said what the fuel specification needed was, and Mobile said they produced it, but they hadn't. And it, it wasn't really till we literally copied exactly the, the fuel that we really got the thing running properly. Mm. It's quite a thirsty engine. It did use a lot of fuel, but it actually gave quite a lot of power. Yeah. Uh, and by the end of the year, I mean, by Japan, you know, that was running 1,000 horsepower, and it, it, it was a, a good engine. But then we made a, a really, I think, a fundamental mistake. Um, we were led into a fundamental mistake because that first year, the, the engine was allowed to run at four bar boost. And for the following year, that was being reduced to, I think it was two and a half. Um, now, at the same time, Cosworth had been doing some work with Yamaha. And Yamaha had produced a little four-cylinder, two-litre engine. Uh, and this engine was giving something like 320, 330 horsepower, which is a hell of a lot from a four-cylinder two-litre. And it had five-valve cylinder heads. And everyone thought, oh, it's because of the five-valve cylinder heads. So when we had to make a decision, were we going to run the, the turbo at low boost? Or at that time, there was an equivalence formula. You could run normally aspirated engines, which I think were three and a half litre at that, that time. Uh, we thought, well, if you can get 
330 horsepower in the little two litre four cylinder, then yeah, we, we're going to be quids in. We're going to be way over 600 horsepower with the, this five valve V8, normally aspirated. But we were nowhere near that. And what we didn't find out really till a little bit later was that all the secrets in that Yamaha engine were actually in the bottom end. It, it was one of the first engines that really was a low friction, mm -hmm. low loss engine. And the five valve heads were actually detracting from performance. The four valve was better. So, you know, we made a, a wrong decision and we, we had to live with a, uh, what I think could have, we, we could have had a much better engine if we'd stayed with the, the yeah. GB engine and, and run it at the lower boost. So, a good team. You're doing, you're making progress, but it's, it's hard going. Good drivers, but not the best drivers of the time. And then this chap comes along, Flavio Briatore. Uh, just want to point out the packet of cigarettes there in the top pocket, always, always there. He certainly looks the part, but when he turned up, what did you make of him? <laughs> Not a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, first, we didn't really know he was coming. Um, there, there was some internal politics going on. Paolini was sort of leaving. Flavio was coming in. Um, and the first race that year was in Brazil. And uh, my sort of first memory of Flavio was that we didn't have the sort of huge hospitality units we have now. We had uh, a little sort of um, shack that we all worked in, and that was everything, engineers, hospitality for what it was worth. Uh, uh, everything was in one room. And we were working away in there, and Flavio walks in with a potential sponsor to talk about a deal. And this potential sponsor says, yeah, can we talk in front of these guys? And Flavio said, oh, don't worry about them. They're only engineers. And I thought, oh, I'm, not, I'm not going to get on with this guy. Uh, but, yeah, I worked with him for many, many years afterwards. And he was in effective. In fact, still do today, believe it or not. Really? Yes, he still has quite a lot to do with Formula One. Yeah, yeah we often see him around Alonso, don't we? And, uh, yeah, he's still, still, still very much um, a fixture. Uh, he's the promoter of the Baku race. Of course, yeah. Um, we'll move on to the, the next slide, which um, is one of my favourite Benetton moments um, because it's, it's good old Johnny Herbert on his debut in Rio in uh, 1989 where he finished fourth, one of the great Formula 1 debuts. We saw Oliver Behrman at the weekend doing a fantastic job for Ferrari at short notice coming in. Uh, now, Johnny came in um, and he couldn't walk properly, could he? he was, I mean, Flavio always had a problem with Johnny at this time. Um, because of his feet. What's your opinion? Was he ready for Formula One at that time? Uh, I don't think he was, but that result was absolutely amazing. Mm. Um, his real champion was Peter Collins. Peter Collins thought he was the boy. And Johnny wasn't fully recovered, there's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, he, he couldn't walk out of the car or anything like that. In fact, under current regulations, I'm sure he wouldn't be able to to drive because you have to get out of the car in 10 seconds and all this sort of stuff. But that race was remarkable. Uh, I think we'd, we'd been out there testing for weeks and um, uh, as we always did test in Rio before first race. And, you know, Johnny was sort of struggling with the heat. He was struggling with his legs. Um, he needed a bike to go around the paddock because he couldn't sort of walk anywhere. And then to get in and do that Grand Prix, finish fourth uh, uh, I think we were all amazed yeah now we're going to skip a, a little bit on here because there's a lot of nitty-gritty history around this time for Benetton um, uh, it was a difficult time for the team with Flavio coming in uh, disruptive in in many ways in terms of challenging you in in, in the way you do things and bringing in of course John Barnard it's all in the it's all in the book um, where uh, we, we talk a lot about John, John Barnard and, and his influence on the team, a very short, explosive time, uh, basically 18 months pretty much, a time when you, Rory, and I think in total 13 senior engineers left the team, essentially because you couldn't really work with John Barnard. Um, but you all came back. Um, so what I wanted to do was... It's too much there to cover in one evening. We could, we could basically do it. Come back tomorrow. I would say come back tomorrow, but obviously you wouldn't be able to get home, so we, we won't do that. Let's, let's, there's a picture here of Roberto Moreno. Um, so this was basically um, 
kind of, you never actually, did you actually work with Moreno at Benetton? Not at Benetton, but um, I knew Roberto well because he used to be my babysitter for my eldest daughter. It's amazing. <laughs> small world, Formula One, small yeah. world. Amazing. Uh, yeah. when, when he first came over to, to the UK, and I, I was doing Formula Ford at the time, and uh, he was driving a, a Royale, and I, I basically built that car for him, very special car, very lightweight car, very uh, much for, you know, for Roberto. And, uh, yeah, in return, he used to babysit for me. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> um, he was a lovely man, and a, a really, he was a good Grand Prix driver, um, but he was sacrificed um, for this guy. So Michael Schumacher came in, uh, that amazing uh, Jordan performance in 91 uh, at Spa, his only Jordan performance, because then uh, Flavio and Tom Walkinshaw, who had come into the team, um, so Barnard had gone, and um, Flavio, actually, a good deal that he did was bringing Tom in, and more importantly, brought in Ross Braun with him. They came into the team and they obviously swooped. One of the early scoops they had was scooping Michael away from Eddie Jordan, much to his chagrin, uh, and working with him uh, at Benetton. Um, tell us a little bit about Michael, um, early Michael. Yeah, I just uh, going back a little bit. You know, when, when Barnard came along, as you say, 13 of us sort of left. And we, we tried to get on with Barnard because I did feel... You, you said earlier, you know, we, we were on a bit of a plateau, weren't we? We, mm. we, we were a third, fourth place team. Or, and I don't think Rory or I knew exactly how we were going to take that next step. And Flavio had the idea of bringing in Barnard. He was a guy who, you know, he knew how to win. And I was quite supportive of the idea. I was very supportive of the idea. Rory was a little bit nervous of it, but, but still supported it. Uh, until the guy arrived, and then you know when we got to know him, we just couldn't work with him. Yeah. He, he, he was just impossible. You know, it was it, 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 it was like all well. You know, it was a Godalming good, Whitney bad. It was as simple as that. Um, so we, we'd all disappeared off and gone to do the Reynard project, and that was actually when I first met Michael, because Michael came round as a, a potential Reynard Formula One driver. And to be honest, I, I didn't really know anything of him at the time. Uh, and it wasn't until later on, you know, when we saw what he did in the Jordan, and like, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, as you say, Flavio and, and Walkinshaw and Bernie, Bernie was very heavily involved, yep. uh, got him signed into the Benetton. But we weren't there at that time. We came back a bit later. Mm. Uh, so I first got to know him really when the next season when we started testing and again the early season tests and um, first race was in Kyle Army mm. that year so we were at Kyle Army testing because that, that's what we always did we went to the warmer places to, to do the first race and, and did the testing there and it was really you know getting to know each other uh, a lot and um, as I said earlier I, I really like Mike uh, still do. I still think he is the probably one of the nicest drivers, if not the nicest driver I've ever worked with. And all round, I'd say he's the best driver I've ever worked with. But we were getting to know each other. And uh, at Kyle Army, um, we were reasonably quick in testing. It was all going quite well. Um, but I, I, what I remember really well about it was that the car had a little bit of low speed understeer. And there's one fast corner at Kyle Army. And it was very nervous through there. And uh, Michael said, he explained what the problems were with the car, and he's, he, he wanted to be the engineer, and he said, no, we've, we've got to run less front wing for the, the high-speed corner. I said, no, that's not, not the way to do it. It's just going to go a bit, a bit worse in the medium speed and low-speed corners. I said, what we need to do is we need to stiffen the rear roll bar because I could see what was happening. The car was just rolling onto the bump rubbers, and I wanted to keep it off the bump rubbers, and that was what, what was making it nervous. He really didn't see that, but we did it anyway, and the car was beautifully balanced. And at that point, I think, you know, the, the trust sort of glued itself together. Yeah. He, he realised that I knew what I was talking about. Well, I'd fooled him into thinking I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and... Uh, and I knew that he was a damn good driver. 
running theme through the book was I definitely found was that everyone I spoke to who worked for the team loved Michael Schumacher. And, you know, the perception of him, certainly to us in, in Britain at that time through the, through the, through the media, was this sort of uh, arrogant German, uh, difficult character, uh, controversial character, rubbed everyone up the wrong way, but not in the team. You absolutely loved him, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely, because he, he, he's such a great human being. You know, he knew everyone in the team. Most drivers don't know anyone beyond those that help them. So they'll know their mechanics, they'll know the sort of chief engineer and their race engineers and things. Michael, he didn't just know everyone in the team, he knew about their families, he knew when the kids were doing exams, he knew what their wives were doing, you know, he, he, he really made it his business to, to, uh, to get into the team and, and uh, people would do anything for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to this picture. This was actually one of my favourite pictures in the book, um, largely because the, the people collected in this very ad hoc debrief in Monaco, this is how it used to be, I guess, in Monaco, the contribution... That's luxury. <laughs> <laughs> the contribution here of these, these people over to Formula 1 over the, over the decades you know, is immense. So, obviously, you've got Ross Braun, Michael, you, Pat, Pat Fry, who's now at Williams, um, and Martin Brundle, who we all know as well. Um, Let's just talk a little bit about Ross. We haven't really talked about him very much yet. And incredibly important person in this story, isn't he? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I didn't really know Ross until uh, af after we'd left Raynard. There was a little sort of secret squirrel group going on in, in Kidlington at, at Tom's place. And we were working on the Benetton. Ross had obviously been technical director there with the, the Jaguar XJ14. XJR14, yeah. 14. Yep. Um, and he was being brought over onto the, the Formula One team. Uh, he had plenty of Formula One experience, you know, from Arrows and well, in fact started at Williams. And uh, I, I think what, what Ross was so good at was actually understanding how to get a team working. Um, you know, in terms of the detail of the engineering, that wasn't his forte. Mm. Uh, I worked with Ross until last year and he, he retired. And it was the same. That wasn't where he was at. He, what he was really good at was getting the team working together, knowing who could do what and just getting the whole... You know, making, making the whole more than the sum of the parts, really, is what I think he was very good at. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, very, very instrumental in, in bringing us up into those uh, first winning years. Yeah. Um, we'll move on to this one. A um, uh, big moment for Martin Brundle, of course, on the, on the podium with, with Mansell and Patrese at Silverstone. Um, only one year with Benetton, um, which is a bit of a regret, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. Second big mistake after dumping the GB mm. was, was dumping the MB. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I have no hesitation in even saying to Martin these days that that was a big mistake when we, we lost him. I, I think part of it, you know, Flavio, Flavio didn't have a scale to him. It, you were either the best or you were nothing. Mm. And I think he, he totally underestimated Martin. I think I did as well because I don't think I quite realised just how good Michael was. But when you look back, you know, Martin, look at Martin against Senna in Formula 3. Who would you choose between the two? Mm. You, you wouldn't. Martin was there with Senna. Yeah. He was, I think, the, the guy who gave Michael the hardest time of you know, any of the, 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 the teammates that he had at, in, in this era. Uh, I think it's a tragedy that he never won a race. He should have won it in Canada that year. Mm. Um, problem with the gearbox, let him down. Uh, yeah, it, it's nice to see him on the podium, but he should have been on the top step a bit more. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, now, this is a, a moment um, you'll remember well. Um, the first win for Michael. Now, this is something I had a personal connection to. When I did this book, I, I came at it from a journalist's point of view. I didn't have any sort of particular affinity with Benetton or any connection to the team. I just thought it was a really good story, and it is a really good story, actually, from start to finish. Um, but this moment, uh, I had a connection to, because I was 18 in 1992, about to go to university, and I, um, I had a little bit of money saved up for university, and instead, 
I spent it on a Page and Moy trip to a spa for the Grand Prix. Um, and at this moment, I w I'd been sat on a little grassy tuft at the long left-hander uh, Puon at the back of the circuit, really great corner. And I'd sat there all day in the rain, and I had no food, and I was cold, I was a bit miserable, and I had to go and get my bus to get back to the, the ferry. But even at 18, I recognised that I'd just seen Michael Schumacher win his first Grand Prix, and I thought, I think he might win a few more. This could be quite a big, quite a big moment. So I'm, I'm quite proud of my own little personal... And we've all got our own connections to those moments, haven't we? Pat, you were there, you were on the pit wall. Tell us about this race. Yeah, but just think, Damien, if you'd spent that money on studying, think where you could be now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be richer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this was a, a hell of a day, wasn't it? And, and this, the story of how he won this race just typifies Michael, uh, and I'm sure most people know it, but for those who don't, uh, we were running well, wet race, typical spa, wet, dry, and... Um, Michael had made a bit of a mistake. Martin had been right behind him, got in front of him. And as Michael followed him, he realised that Martin's wet tyres were starting to blister. So he thought, now's time for a pit stop. Came into the pits, first into the pits, really based on that one bit of information that he had, onto the dry tyres because the, the wets weren't going to last. And it was such a, a good decision yeah. based on such an intelligent thought and it, it won him the race. Pure Michael Schumacher. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I also love this picture. Um, three great drivers, all in the same frame. We had such a brief time, period of time, when we had Prost, Senna, and Schumacher together. Um, uh, you worked with two of them. Um, again, we talked a little bit earlier on about um, young, young Senna. Um, Michael, at this stage, these two guys at the front, they knew he was coming up behind them fast, didn't he? Um, what, what was he like at that stage and you thought you could just see him starting to break through? Well, you know, when, when you look at... I, I'm often asked about different drivers that I work with and, and if you take three champions, so Senna, Schumacher and then Alonso, the interesting thing is that each one of those, when I work with them, they, they, they were a decade apart. And a decade's a long while in anyone's life in motorsport, it could be centuries, and it's so different. So trying to compare Senna to Schumacher, Schumacher to Alonso as drivers, you know, it's very hard. I, I was saying earlier about how with, with Senna, you know, we needed him to, to be our data acquisition system. With Michael, we were already had a lot of data on the car. But, you know, the thing that all of them have, and I don't think it's unique to racing drivers, I think all elite sportsmen have the, the same thing, is this incredible self-belief that they have. Ayrton got into that Tolman and he drove it. He was the best driver in the world. Um, you know, and he knew that wasn't the right car. In fact, actually, when he first drove the car at the test in November, um, prior to, to the season he raced in, he sort of said, yeah, yeah, it's not a car to win in, but who knows, maybe one day he might get a podium on it. Yeah, but he was capable of doing it. He knew that. And Michael, exactly the same. Um, later on, after this story, but Fernando, exactly the same. It's this incredible self-esteem that they, they have. A and a work ethic as well. They all work bloody hard. Yes, yeah. OK, we move on to this one now. So, 1994... This was, the, this was the chapter I knew was hanging over me that I had to write and deal with. Uh, very, very... What a, what a weird, weird season for you, because finally it all comes together and you're winning. And this, I thought this, this picture kind of sums up where Michael was compared to the opposition that year. Yeah, we were on fire that year. Mm. <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, yes. Yeah, that one. Um, let's just stick on this picture for a moment. So the, the B194, it's one of the most controversial... Formula One cars in history. We all know the stories. Um, and I knew when I was telling this, this story, I had to tell your story and the people who were at the team and what they were saying, telling me about this, this year. And it, I think it's fascinating. It's fascinating to, to go back over it. Um, tell me why that car was so good. I think that it owed a lot, funnily enough, to the active car that we'd done the year before, mm. the 193. 
Um, in developing that active car, we'd learned a lot about vehicle dynamics, and we also had learned a lot about aerodynamics. And when, the, when it was announced in Canada uh, in 1993 that they were going to ban active suspension, we immediately just turned all our tools onto what do we have to do now to make a passive car. And we, I, I think one of the things with, with the active car was you could get it to run at the ride heights you wanted for the aerodynamics. Yeah, that, that's what it was really about. Mm. Uh, yeah, it had better tyre grip, had you know, better uh, ride control of, of the tyres and things like that, but, but really it's about the aerodynamics. So we, we really worked on the suspension. Um, we had a, quite a complicated passive system there, which had a lot of disc springs, and we, could, we, we wrote some programs that allowed us to design these disc spring stacks to, to give us the sort of curves that we would have had with a, an active car. But then we also realized that we couldn't get away with the very peaky aerodynamics that we had on the active car. So we, we really started developing on a much wider aero map in the, in the wind tunnel. And it came together to produce a car that was you know, almost as good as that 85 car mm. um, that, that we spoke of earlier. Now, of course, after, after Senna's accident in Imola, there were all sorts of things happening with the cars. And, uh, it was knee-jerk reaction, and I don't mean that in a bad way, because I think Max realized that we were we were at a very pivotal point in, in Formula One. Uh, we had just killed our best driver. And if we, didn't, if we weren't seen to be doing something, then the sport was going to go through another Le Mans 1955 type of, type of thing. But the changes that were made, and they came in bit by bit by bit, um, they really did neuter that car. And all this work we'd done into producing this really, really beautiful car, excellent car, um, it really didn't have that edge by the time we got the plank on it and uh, cut away the diffuser and there were so many other changes that we had to make that year. Yeah. Very difficult summer. We had the British Grand Prix with the, the, the black flag incident and uh, Michael having a two-race ban hanging over his head into the, into the summer. Uh, you were disqualified because of the plank at Spa, which was, I know, was something that really still niggles you now for, for understandable reasons. Um, we'll, we'll come on to the fire briefly in a, in a second, but um, there's obviously also the big elephant in the room, the old traction control story, which was has always hang o hung over this car, hung over you yep. as a team. Um, and it, you know, I know you said to me, and Rory said the same, that it almost drove you from the sport. It was so such a difficult time. Um, when I came to this, I, I had to ask Pat the question, tell me, did this car have traction control? You know, was there anything illegal on this car? Um, what do you say today? Absolutely not. Um, the, the guy who'd been doing a lot of the, uh, the control work on the active car, Tad Chapsky, he'd done the gearbox control, um, done the launch control on the, on the 93 car. When he adapted the software onto the 94 car, he didn't do it very well. He'd left some menus there, but there was really nothing underneath those menus. Now, when it all got investigated, a guy called Alan Prudham, who was the FIA software scrutineer, he came up to the factory and he looked at everything and he said, oh, what's this about? So we looked at, at, at the start the, of the race. Uh, I can't remember which race it was, but you know, right when he'd come in. And it was actually pretty rubbish start and, yeah. and it was he said yeah no I can see there's nothing going on there but you have to understand the politics behind it and you have to understand the enormous battle that was just springing up between Max Mosley and Flavio Briatore mm. um, which really went back to the Barcelona race after, after Monaco um, sorry after Imola when the teams have sort of rebelled against some of the safety ideas that Max wanted to, to impose. And Flavio, was, he was waving the flag higher than anyone else, and he was really attacking Mosley. In fact, he, he, we were in a debrief, and he came into the, the office, and he said, 
that's the last we'll ever hear of Max Mosley. Mm. Uh, that's a dangerous thing to say. Yes. <laughs> uh, and there is no doubt in some of the things that happened, there was, there was politics going on. Yeah. Um, that car was 100% legal. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I, if, if someone had been trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, I'd have seen it. I was looking at data continuously. I, I know that, that that car was good. And you can see some of the things that were going on. Yeah, the Silverstone incident was just blown out of all proportion. You know, a black flag for nudging past someone on a, on a formation lap. You know, we look back at videos and we saw it happening time and time again. The plank in Spa, the regulations at that time said that you were allowed one millimetre of wear on the plank. If you'd got in excess of one millimetre of wear on the plank, then you had to take the plank off and weigh it, and the weight had to be whatever percent it was of a, a new plank. They refused to do that. Mm. They just said, no, you're out. And, you know, there, there were an awful lot of things going against us there. Let's, let's take a look at the, the famous fire. So Hockenheim, 94, um, and Jos Verstappen comes into the pits. Now, for the, for the book, um, the, the guy here, Paul Seabee, a long, long-term um, uh, Benetton employee. In fact, he's still at the team as Alpine today. And I, I, I doorstopped him at the Alpine F1 launch a couple of weeks ago and said, will you come to Brooklands? And he said, I really want to come, I really want to come, but it depends, I'm still doing my day job, and it depends how we're doing. They're not doing very well, are they? So he's not here. <laughs> so Paul, Paul couldn't make it. He's still fairly busy. Um, and I also spoke to the photographer, Stephen T., great, great photographer, uh, long-time face in Formula One, wearing jeans, uh, no, he was wearing shorts and a T-shirt when he took this picture. Um, so, uh, and he didn't know what he'd got until the following day. This, this was still um, the days it was... Um, uh, st still film. So w when it got back to, to LAT's uh, base, uh, the, the film got developed and they said, Stephen, you better have a look at what you've got here. And he, he got this, this image. Now you saw this from the pit wall. Um, I felt it from the pit wall. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously I had my back to it. Um, yeah. And I, I thought, oh, what's that? And then turned around to look at the pit stop as I normally would. And yeah. By that time it was well aflame. And uh, the story behind this, uh, jo uh, Joanne Villa del, del Prat, who was a very entertaining interview when I managed to get hold of him. We had a very funny uh, couple of hours uh, on a Zoom call. Um, and he admitted that um, the filter was taken out, but he claims he'd got permission to do it, and it, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't simply trying to gain an advantage. Uh, it's very complicated, actually. I, I don't want to, probably shouldn't go too much into it, but that, this all just added to this incredibly stressful time. Yeah, because we were in the wrong there. Um, you know, Joanne, heart of gold, I mean, lovely guy, but he, he was always sort of, oh, what can I do here, what can I do there, without looking at all the implications. And if you wanted to make a, a change to the refueling rig, you had to write to the FIA, you had to say exactly what you were doing, and that, that communication was shared with all the teams. Uh, Joanne says he got permission for it, and I think that was by saying to Charlie, can we take the filter out? And Charlie, I doubt Charlie said, yes, of course you can. But, yeah. it, but Joanne probably turned it from English into Spanish as a, a yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, although it's never proven that that was actually what caused the fire, there's every likelihood that it, it, it did allow something through which jammed the valve. It's, yeah. it's very possible. Now, we, we come to the end of that year, Adelaide, and this is Michael leading Damon Hill before the famous incident. Um, so when you saw what happened, um, two, two questions, I guess. First one, did you think he meant it? And second, did you think he was going to get disqualified? Uh, let's answer the second one first. Yeah, I did think we were in, in trouble. In fact, I think I said on the radio... Um, you know, don't celebrate, I think, I don't think that that's going to get through the stewards. Um, so I was, I was pretty upset, and, but stewards decided it was a racing accident, and therefore I decided it was a racing accident. Because <laughs> uh, the, the stewards are never wrong, you know. No, <laughs> we've noticed. <laughs> um, however, I think, you know, at, at the time, the steering arm was broken. There's no doubt he didn't have control of the car, and 
it hit Damon's car. And I think at the time I, I could have thought, yeah, okay, that, that's the way it happened. Uh, but then when you go on and you sort of look at the, the total Schumacher history, and bear in mind, you know, I said he's one of the nicest guys I've ever worked with. But I think there was a little bit of red mist there at times. And, and I think if, if Michael had time to think about anything, he, he was perfect. If he didn't have time to think, I think his reactions, his, his competitive instinct got the better of him at times, I think. I didn't realize it then. No, no one realized it then. But then when you take the Villeneuve instant, you take the Monaco instant, things like that, and you begin to think, well, okay, I wonder what, I, what happened in Adelaide. Yes. You'll never know. No, no. Um, we're, we're sort of running a little bit short of time, um, and I want to give you a chance to ask Pat some questions. There's an awful lot more um, to talk about. Um, 95, how you had a, a season, basically kind of, a, I could describe it as retribution, where you, you won it, and you won it without really any shadow of doubt. Um, and that must have been, that must have meant an awful lot to you. Yeah, so much. I mean, in the 94, yeah, I really wondered whether I wanted to carry on. And two things you can do, you can quit, or you can go out and do it again. We went out and did it again, and yeah. that was worth so much more. And also, just quickly, before we throw it open to you guys to ask some questions, um, the end of Benetton is a, it's a long spiral down, basically, from, from 96 until um, 2001. So the team was sold to Renault in March 2000, but a little bit like the Tolman-Benetton transition, there was that period where it was still known as Benetton, despite the fact it was actually Renault. So the final race was Suzuka 2001. Um, and you described to me that that whole period, really, you were trying to build the team up to be sold. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think what people realised was, don't realise, was we were actually quite a small team. And if they don't realise that, then I'm quite proud of what I did, because that was the whole idea. But, you know, you take now, 2024, um, a Formula One engine supply for a season cost 12 million euros. Then we were paying 17 million pounds for our engine supply. And at the end of the year, and this is my friend Flavio, of course, running the engines, we got another bill because we'd done more testing than we said we were going to do. Yes. So, you know, we, we were spending so much money on engines and it really was difficult running the team. We really were very limited on, on what we could do. And I knew then that the manufacturers were coming. What we had to do was we, we had to be aligned, ideally owned by a manufacturer. Mm. Uh, and so that was, you know, as technical director, that was my role really, was to try and make that deal happen with, with Renault, yeah. which we, we did. Um, I had a very funny interview with Flavio. It took me a long time to get him. I managed to get him on the phone. Um, he's got a wonderful... Um, woman who works with him and was working with him through the Benetton era, uh, Patricia Spinelli, who's an um, uh, important character in, a, in her own right in the, in the story. Um, she replied to me and said, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some time with Flavio, and got on the phone. She said, you've got 20 minutes. I was like, oh, God. I actually got about 45 minutes with him, which was pretty good going. Um, and even some of it I could understand. His, his <laughs> accent was so strong. Sometimes it was just, oh, no idea what he just said there. Um, but I asked him what um, he was most proud of for Benetton, uh, era and kind of you know one of those easy questions I thought set him up to say something about Schumacher and you know beating the establishment and basically he said he's more proud of Supertech and selling engines back to you at 17 million uh, dollars uh, which is typical Flavio isn't it? Yep yeah. absolutely. Yeah. On that note I'd like to make sure you get a chance to ask Pat some questions so um, let's um, uh, raise your hands and we'll uh, Harry's got a, a mic here we've got one over over on this side of the room here. Yep. Uh, wonderful words from, from Pat and, of course, from Damien. And the book is wonderful. If you haven't bought it, uh, you're missing out. And I hope what you've heard has, uh, um, has whetted your appetite. Um, I'm not going to ask Pat or Damien a question because it's all in the book and it's a brilliant book. So that's all I'm going to say. And what, what, what's your so, permission, Simon? This is Mor Morris Hamilton, another very well-known, well-respected motorsport journalist, as I'm sure you all know. Pat, you made brief reference, and Damien in the same, to having Berger and Alesi in the same team. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Did Gerhard really 
keep winding John up. <laughs> Not half. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting because, of course, Michael had um, had left to go to Ferrari, and uh, Flavio, I think he 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 was really pissed off that that happened. You know, he he, he didn't appreciate that at all. So he thought his way of getting back at, at Ferrari was to take both their drivers. So we took Alessi and Berger. <clears throat> the ridiculous thing was that we paid them so much, we could have given that to Michael, he might have stayed. Um, you know, it, it, it was madness. But um, oh, they, they, were, they were so good to work with and so frustrating to work with. I mean, John, I, I love John. He, he, he's probably, next to Michael, he's my, my favourite driver. And it, it, it's rather nice because they're both around the, the circuit now, so I saw both of them in Bahrain last week and uh, they're both around. But my favourite my favorite story with, with Jean was um, at Silverstone, we were, we were in a good position, we were second or third, I think, in the race, and a wheel bearing failed. And Jean got the car back to the pits and stopped it, and then we had to retire it. He got out of the car, he's in a filthy mood, and there's a stack of tyres there, and he hit a stack of tyres, knocked them over, which hit a toolbox, knocked that, everything was flying around. And I'd come off the pit wall to see, you know, whether we could get the car running or anything. And I, I sort of witnessed this. So I grabbed him by the collar and I marched him out the back of the garage and I put him in the support truck. And the support truck doesn't have door handles on the inside. <laughs> and I said, I'll let you out when you've calmed down. And then went back to the pit wall for the rest of the race. <laughs> Pat, thank you for some enjoyable anecdotes there. Um, the success of Formula One largely lies in the grey areas of the technical regulations, and I wonder if there's any technical regulation, in, re regulation innovation that you particularly enjoyed over your time. I certainly enjoyed the active era. Um, you know, when we had the car with active suspension, with four-wheel steer, with power braking, all those sort of things, that, that, that was, as an engineer, that was a hell of a lot of fun to get all that working together and to coordinate the different controls. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I think, you know, these days people say, oh, there's no room for innovation. There's, there's loads of room for innovation. There's so many things you can do these days. Um, the stuff we're doing right now with AI and ML, with artificial intelligence and machine learning and stuff like that, how, you know, we, we're bringing in CFD to sort of, not exactly replace wind tunnels yet, but, but getting there. Um, the work I did on the 2022 car, where we, we were able to take a totally new way of approaching the aerodynamics, all fascinating. And, you know, people all say, well, what was the best era? And my answer is the next one. It's always the best one. Hi. Um, this question relates to Formula One as it is today. And I, I, I've become sort of increasingly turned off as it becomes more and more technical. And there were some conversations about simplifying the power units and the cars to make it a bit more, a bit less technical because it, it to me, I'm not really interested in how many elements they've got in the front wing and you know, all these very detailed conversations. I've cancelled my motorsport subscription. I just fed up with all of these really detailed, complex, technical debates versus good racing on the track. I don't know how you might feel about that thought. I think motorsports always had this sort of trichotomy of are we a sport, are we an entertainment, are we a business? Um, you can add many things to that. Do, do we have a, a duty to sort of contribute to the automotive industry or to society as a whole or, or, or whatever? I mean, we continually do that. I think that since Liberty Media took over Formula One, I think very much the entertainment side has been at the forefront. But we do an awful lot of fan studies. We, we we try and understand our fans because we're getting a whole new raft of fans now, very different demographics to, to the past. 
um, there is still a significant number. Uh, I, I was quite surprised when I, I joined Formula One uh, because I thought, having worked 40 odd years in the teams, I thought it was only a few nerds who, who, who liked the, the engineering side. But actually we find it's quite a significant amount who are interested in it. So we have to get that balance. But always the best thing is good racing. Uh, and that's why you know, one of the big projects I've been involved with in the last few years was the 2022 car and getting the aerodynamics so the cars could race closer. Of course, the teams always try and spoil it and they're trying to do things differently. But, um, yeah, don't, don't underestimate the, the, the technical side is interesting to a number of people. And if we get it right, it doesn't detract from the racing the aerodynamics of the 2022 car enhance the racing. So there's, a, there's space for both. I'll, I'll just add to that that um, I think the problem I have, I work in the media and so I'm trying to tell good stories and I, I'm, I'm still very much engaged in the modern world of Formula One. When I wrote this book, I loved going back to, I'm a child of the 80s, so I loved going back to the 80s and talking, about, uh, talking to Pat and to others about those times and the 90s as well. Um, you can't go back. We're going forward, and it is a technical age we're living in. The world's changing. And I'm quite interested in this changing audience because I'm hearing a lot of older people who've been watching Formula 1 for years, and it's in their blood, and they've loved it for years, getting turned off by what they're seeing now. Um, but there is a new engagement. There are new people coming to the sport, and it's the first time I've experienced it. When I was at school, I was the only kid who liked motor racing. No one else was interested, you know? And uh, that's not the case anymore. And um, I've got uh, a son who's uh, 19 who um, I used to take racing, and he was, he was interested. He didn't love it. Um, but he came to the sport on his own way, not through me, but through these characters we've got now, like Leclerc and Norris and George Russell, and he followed them on social media. And they're great characters. There's still good characters there. We're going through a period of domination. It's always difficult with Verstappen and, and Red Bull. But there's a, there's a great bunch of drivers. And racing, the actual bit on the track, hasn't changed. It's still the same, I think. Um, and that's despite, despite itself sometimes. Formula doesn't always help itself. But there's, and there's a lot of good stuff happening. And I'm still intrigued to see what's going to happen next and see what Pat comes up with in 2026 uh, for, the, for the next generation. It'd be better than this one. Another question. <laughs> there we go. You heard it here first. Better than this one. Uh, how long was John Barnard involved with Benetton and did he come up with anything useful while he was there? <laughs> so the first answer is too long. <laughs> and the second answer is actually yes he did. Um, he he persuaded uh, Benetton to invest quite heavily. Um, and that was something we, we were lacking. You know, our machine shop was uh, all manual machines, etc. cetera. Um, we had one autoclave that was uh, being made from an old steam boiler. You know, it, it was, um, we weren't very well equipped and we weren't very well off. And, and John had worked at Ferrari, had worked at McLaren. Uh, he knew the sort of equipment that was needed and he persuaded Benetton to, uh, to invest in that. Uh, and I mean, two of those autoclaves are still in Enstone today, although they were originally, uh, well, no, they were installed at Enstone. He, he worked while we were still at Whitney, but um, those, those autoclaves didn't get installed there. They went into... To, to Enstone. So, yeah, I think, you know, he did, he did bring a new era of how to do things, uh, and he increased the professionalism, for sure, but he probably did it in quite a divisive way. With hindsight, you needed the Barnard era to happen. We needed a kick. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah we, I said earlier, we were stuck on this plateau, and that's why, initially, I was very supportive of it, because yeah, Rory and I knew our limitations. We couldn't quite understand what was needed to break through the, those limitations. Uh, and, you know, you see it, uh, you still see it today in, in teams where you, you don't get that sort of, um, I need to be careful what I say, but I worked for a team recently that 
perhaps could have done with a little bit more outside influence. Hi, right, Pat, down the back over here. Um, totally agree that the racing and the technical sides are really, really key to engaging pretty much everyone. Another thing that I've always loved is just watching the cars move and the driving element of it. I think watching Berger um, in Adelaide in 86, just now I was watching some stuff 96 last night, even 2006, the cars move around all the time. N nowadays, they're on rails, they're absolutely glued to the track. For 2026 or maybe 2030, whatever the next regs are, is there any way of writing the regs which gets the racing amazing, but the cars looking brilliant as well? Yeah, I got, I, I got some sympathy for, with you there. Yeah, I, I love watching rally cars. You know, uh, I think when you when you watch in car on a, a modern Formula One car, even though I know you know you couldn't drive that car the way those guys are driving it, but it sort of looks like you could. But when you watch a rally car, you think, "Geez, those guys are skilled." And I agree. I'd like to see the cars move around a little bit more. So on the, on the 26 car, it, uh, it does have less tire grip and it has a lot less aerodynamic grip. So I think we will start to see them move around a little bit. Um, it, it is difficult because, you know, the, the teams are so big now. There are so many engineers, there are so many people just devoted to making that car go quicker. And the quicker it goes, the better it sticks to the road or vice versa. Uh, and it's very hard for the regulator to to keep that in check. But I'm, I'm absolutely with you. Um, you know, sometimes uh, you hear this sort of armchair myth that oh, what, what we need is we need more mechanical grip and less aerodynamic grip. And my answer to that is look at the race in the wet. What we actually need is less mechanical grip because a car in the wet is difficult to drive and the racing is better. So... Yeah, and the cars move around a lot, all for that. Just a quick comment first. Uh, it occurred to me, Pat, when you told the story about the uh, Pirelli, sorry, the Michelin tyres in 1984 and Ron's banning of you having the, the latest spec, you got your own back at Benetton in 93 with the HB engine, I think, didn't you? Because he couldn't ever run the same latest spec of that engine when he was... No, we didn't. No, okay. it, uh, far from it, actually. <laughs> it, was, it was almost the opposite because... Uh, we had the works engines and, and McLaren didn't. And that meant that we had to run the engines in the spec that Cosworth told us to run them. And, of course, traction control was back then. And uh, Cosworth insisted that you couldn't do traction control by cutting the spark, which is the only way to get fast reaction on traction control. Uh, and so our traction control worked on... Uh, ignition retard and fueling and, and stuff like that. And, and it was rubbish compared to the McLaren because they said, we bought the engine, we make uh, electronic control units, we're going to do all that and we'll do it the way we want it to. So uh, I actually think they, their engine was a more usable engine than, than we had. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, both uh, Damien and Pat. Uh, a big hand, please, for an absolutely fascinating presentation.